This review was made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Hey guys, I'm here at SoCal Games and Comics in Temecula, California, celebrating Free Comic Book Day, along with regulars and newcomers who are checking out comics for the first time. And since comic publishers are trying to reach out more and more to the female demographic, let's start things off with DC Superhero Girls. I haven't seen any of the TV show from which this comic is based, but apparently DC is trying to reach out to young female readers slash viewers by taking their iconic superheroines and putting them in a high school through which they can hone their superpowers. Really? They couldn't figure out how to present these characters and what makes them awesome on their own merits, so they just made them like the little girls to whom they're pandering to make them more relatable? Great. Instead of having Supergirl punching meteors back into space, she's gonna be fretting over algebra tests and squeeing over Bruce Wayne asking her out to the prom. Sign me up for that! And again, I haven't seen the show, but why did this superhero school enroll Poison Ivy, Harley Quinn, and Katana? I mean, maybe they're showing a young Pamela Isley and Harleen Quinzel, who were more or less good eggs before they turned to lives of crime, although the giant mallet is a little questionable, but Katana? I have no idea how she's supposed to be fighting crime with that sort of hers non-lethally. Or do cartoon politics these days dictate that these girls will only be fighting legions of robots so they can be as deadly as they want with no moral repercussions? We open on... Wonder Woman fighting Cheetah? I want to give this comic points for showing us right off the bat that there will indeed be superhero action where I thought it would just be lacking, but again, why is a villain at this school for heroes? Cheetah and I used to be friends. Then she came home from Anthrocon and was never the same again. But now I must treat her as my enemy. She said hi to Bruce the other day. The bitch must die. Actually, all this melodrama in Wendy's narration is kind of pointless, since she and Cheetah are still friends, I think, and they're just sparring in Wildcat's P.E. class. Okay, nice touch making Wildcat a P.E. teacher, but shouldn't he be a boxing coach? If we're going to use JSA characters as the faculty, why not have this mixed fighting class be taught by Mr. Terrific? Also, since this is a PE class, I'm left wondering why they don't have standard PE uniforms. Maybe the idea is to teach the students how to fight while wearing their unique costumes without them being an issue, but I would prefer that the comic explain weird things like that instead of me relying on my own imagination to make things seem more plausible. We later find the students gathering at the auditorium for an assembly. Shut your traps and open your ear holes. Principal Waller's got an announcement. Thank you, Vice Principal Grodd. Principal Waller? Vice Principal Grodd? This comic is not dark enough to have supervillains like them playing the authorities. Anyway, Principal Waller, who was designed to look exactly like Vixen, why not just have her be Principal Vixen? Reminds the student body that the finals are tomorrow. Apparently, the finals are passed by demonstrating that your superpowers have improved. Okay, and what about non-powered heroes like Blue Beetle, Harley Quinn, Katana, Batgirl, Bumblebee, and Cyborg? What about Hal Jordan or the other Lanterns? Shouldn't they be in a special program led by their respective core to teach them how to use their power rings? After Grodd bellows at the students to get back to class, Wonder Woman, Batgirl, and Supergirl head off to their Intro to Supersuits class. Meaning that they aren't wearing their superhero outfits? I guess capes and cowls are just the latest style. Supergirl dashes off since she left her super outfit at home. Okay. And then we jump to the aforementioned supersuits class, which is being taught by Crazy Quilt. And because he has an affinity for technicolored clothing, they made him into a flaming gay stereotype. How progressive. 
Emergency! Emergency! Emergency of the worst sort! A fashion emergency! Well, I think you're being a trendsetter. I thank you, Wonder Woman. I am a trendsetter, aren't I? Yes, they gave the job of super suit teacher to a man who's so dumb that he had no idea what he was wearing when he walked out of the house this morning. Seriously, though, Crazy Quilt's deal is that he went through an experiment in prison which was supposed to restore his vision, but it left him seeing nothing but blindingly vibrant colors. Why would anyone hire this guy as a super suit designer when he has botched eyesight? And I'm pretty sure that Wonder Woman just told him that he was a trend center for the sake of shutting him up. The champion of truth, ladies and gentlemen. We cut back to Supergirl on her way to retrieve her suit, except that her narration boxes tell us that she just had a panic attack. When I see the Kent farm, the knots in my stomach finally start to unwind. None of that superhero high stuff can bother me here. That's right, girls. When you're confronted with issues like your next class starting, just run home so you can avoid them completely. That's a good lesson for the kids. Her Uncle Jonathan and Aunt Martha... Why did you say that name? Ask her what's up. I'm quitting school. What happened? Nothing yet. But something's coming. Something bad. It's finals! Supergirl! Able to wind tall buildings in a single... Yeah. Look, I get it. The idea is to endear us to Supergirl by giving her problems not unlike our own. But this is just stupid. The finals are an evaluation of whether or not your superpowers have improved, and apparently Supergirl is no stranger to fighting villains or saving the school. She's clearly grown in her superheroing prowess by at least some degree. But even if she didn't, is this how she reacts to any kind of pressure? By running her way to her cousin's house? Yeah, that's some fine superhero material right there. Speaking of, why does she feel the need to go all the way to the Kents to get a little emotional support? If she can't get the kind of assurance that she needs from Batgirl or Wonder Woman, maybe this would be a good chance to introduce the school's guidance counselor, Dr. Fate. We then get a flashback to explain why she's so triggered. Before Krypton's destruction, Kara zor was just your average teenage girl. She's picked on by some other girls for wearing her family crest on her backpack, and for riding a horse to school instead of a hoverboard. To all the ladies in my audience, I ask you. If you have a girl who comes to school every day on horseback, what are the odds that you would not try to be her best friend? Kara shows up late for her science final, which is the demonstration of a new chemical she developed which makes crystals grow three times their size. The test is successful, but when one of the bullies unties her horse, Kara rushes off to get her back, and her crystal grows so large it smashes up through the ceiling and who knows how many floors. So, while her experiment technically worked, she ends up failing the exam. Speaking of, her name, Kara Zorel, is written in English, but her grade is written in Kryptonian. Weird. If those girls were here now, I'd give them a piece of my mind. No, you wouldn't. You'd be begging for mercy while they kicked you around like a hacky sack. Martha says that if Kara doesn't do those finals, then the bullies will win. Um, no. The bullies are dead. Remember the whole Krypton blowing up thing? No matter what else happens, Kara will always have the last laugh by default. Actually, that one comment about the bullies winning is all the motivation that Kara needs to fly back to class. And rather than fly faster than a speeding bullet, or better yet, faster than the speed of light to reverse the flow of time so that she isn't late to class, she flies so slow that she's able to get taken down by a kryptonite arrow fired by a shadowy figure who totally isn't Lex Luthor. Apparently, that arrow is really painful, since Kara is yelling what looks like it should be a very soft groan. Not Luther crosses her name off his list, with Wonder Woman, Bumblebee, Kitana, Batgirl, and Ivy remaining. Gotta give him some credit. By taking Supergirl out of commission, he's definitely world smarter than Jesse Eisenberg's Luther. <laughs> so, that was DC Superhero Girls. Can't say this did it for me. I applaud DC's efforts to attract young girls into reading their books, but this is just dumb. Yes, there is something to be said about heroes who are also the everyman that the reader can identify with, but I would wager that most girls would want to see these superheroines kicking ass with the same kind of proficiency as the male heroes. I want to see Supergirl punching cosmic threats in the face and telling them to get off her planet, not freeze up whenever she has to take a test. I won't be picking up any more issues of this comic.
But you know which comic I am getting more and more into? The Misadventures of Grumpy Cat and Pokey. If you're contributing at least one dollar to my Patreon, you're probably familiar with my review for Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever. The movie wasn't anything great, but it did open my eyes to the potential that she has in appearing in other media, and she translates pretty nicely into comic form. Our first story, Paws of Justice, opens with Grumpy Cat and her brother, Pokey, watching Batman vs. Superman. Pokey, who loves the movie, can't help but gush over how awesome it is. And then they realized that they were both heroes and teamed up to fight the real bad guys. Nobody saw that twist coming a mile away. Grumpy Cat Reviews. Somebody make that happen. I'll bet it'll win an award for most plot holes. Oh, you sweet, naive kitty. May you never discover the Transformers movies. Pokey dreams of being a superhero himself and greets the next day as Super Pokey, Defender of Truth, Protector of Justice. Wearer of underpants. As opposed to everyone else in the world who just goes commando. Grumpy tries to rain on Pokey's parade by pointing out that he doesn't have any superpowers, but he believes that he can do anything if he puts his mind to it. Truly inspirational, but that doesn't stop him from falling like a sack of hammers when he climbs onto the roof to see if he can fly. Despite that setback, and Grumpy's continued pessimism, Pokey refuses to give up. He proposes that Grumpy be a sidekick, and she agrees on the condition that he uses his heat vision to light a nearby newspaper on fire. He stares intently at the paper, and as luck would have it, the sunlight refracts through their wind chime in such a way so that the paper actually does catch fire. Since Grumpy's mouth is sufficiently shut, Pokey wastes no time making her a super suit. Well, I look stupid, and I can barely see anything. Why do I have to wear this dumb mask again? Because you're the most recognizable cat in the world, and anyone who sees you is going to want to kidnap you and hold you for millions of dollars. Pokey explains that the mask is supposed to protect her secret identity, while no such precautions are made about protecting his own identity, and they steal away into the night for their first patrol. Pokey notices a house down the street has its lights on, but the family who lives there is away on vacation. This looks like a job for the fearsome fursome! Super Pokey and Grumpy Cat! Wait, my superhero name is just my regular name? What about protecting my secret identity? Grumpy would be really good at CinemaSins. It turns out that the house is being burglarized, and Pokey tries to subdue one of the thieves with his non-existent heat vision. He calls on Grumpy for help, but she's having a bit of a wardrobe malfunction with her mask, causing the thief to trip over her and into his partner in crime. By the way, what is it that these guys are stealing? A collection of old VCRs? It isn't long before the cops show up to take them away, and the cats return to their civilian lives. But if evil rears its ugly face again, the world will once again feel the razor-sharp claws of the world's furriest heroes, Super Pokey and Grumpy Cat! Ugh, does that mean a sequel? Or worse, some kind of shared cinematic universe? Just terrible. And I should probably stop right there. The rest of this comic is so worth not spoiling. The absolute worst thing I can say about this comic is how sometimes the artwork on Paws of Justice makes Pokey look just as grumpy as Grumpy Cat, but otherwise, it's a cute little setup where two polar opposites are forced to live with each other, and it's pretty funny all throughout. If you want something light and fun, it's definitely worth checking out. Be sure to tune in next time when I'll be reviewing Captain Canuck. See you later, eh? Sometimes we're stuck, told to be ordinary, afraid to jump, held down by the fear of flying, so we hide.